um, I'd just like to reflect a little bit on, on how we came to take this issue up. Um, as Roger said, we, we are in the hot spot as a council because the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast, where most of our fisheries operate, um, is an area that's seeing significant uh, climate change effects. Um, but, but this started for us back in about 2010 when, when we, we were at a very important inflection point in our council's history. We had been through about 20 years of very difficult stock rebuilding. And we did that uh, all at the same time. We were, we were simultaneously rebuilding a lot of different stocks in the Mid-Atlantic. And, and in social terms, uh, in terms of our relationship to the fishing community, it was a very hard time. But we made a lot of hard decisions. Um, we, we implemented quota-based management. We had scientific basis uh, for establishing those quotas. And we were able to rebuild our stocks. And so we, we were at a point that we had done that. We had sort of crossed somewhat of a finish line. And yet we still had a lot of problems in our fisheries. And we, did, we, we, we wanted to step back and reflect on our history, but really reach out to the public and reach out to our constituents um, in the fisheries, including the commercial fishermen, the recreational fishermen, uh, different stakeholders, and really get their more organic perspectives about what they wanted to see the future look like. Because much of our history had been shaped by uh, a reactionary posture. We were reacting to news that a stock was overfished. And so the, the, the rebuilding of those stocks really dominated our history. But this was an important transition point. So we went out and we had port meetings up and down the coast. Uh, we, we met with a very wide range of constituents. And, and one of the important themes that came out of that was that they were concerned about shifting fish populations and how, how are we as managers going to deal with it. And so following that process, uh, we developed a very comprehensive strategic plan. We spent a couple of years doing that. And the strategic plan for us provides a framework I think for considering these big types of uh, systemic threats and risks to the uh, management of our fisheries and to these managed resources. So it put us in a position to consider these things in a fairly structured way. So on, on this slide, I, I really don't see any skeptics. I see three species of fish that are affected by climate change. Um, you know, and I, I appreciated Roger's talk and his reference to Malin Pinsky's work. Malin Pinsky is now at Rutgers. And he, he helped us in one of our science workshops that we recently had on climate change in terms of uh, highlighting how, how these climate velocities play out relative to fish movement. And, and, and the movement of fish is something that I, th I think is a very powerful story related to climate change. It's, it's not, um, you know, it, it, it's not uh, something that's as controversial. You all are in the communication business, and I think it's a great opportunity to talk about some of those changes. But, um, these three species are affected in different ways. So you have summer flounder, Atlantic mackerel, and black sea bass. You'll notice they're all pointing up, and that's not by accident. They're all heading north, um, which is a concern for us in the mid-Atlantic. And it has big, big management implications for us as well. But fish have very strong thermal preferences, and they also have tails. So, you know, you put those two <laughs> things together, and, 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 and they don't wait to be convinced. Uh, that conditions are changing. If conditions change and they become unfavorable, uh, they simply move. Now we have other species that, that aren't as mobile, but um, behind each one of these species, there's, there's a very significant story. Um, I would point out that, you know, the, the, the generalizations in the Penske paper are very important. I mean, that, that's an important aspect of climate change to understand. But when you think about individual species, uh, those movements need to be very carefully understood in the, in the fuller context of the marine ecosystem. And, you know, in the mid-Atlantic, we have, we have an ecosystem that has very strong estuarine influences, but then we also have two major ocean currents. We have the Labrador Current and we have the Gulf Stream. And, and so those things combined together with climate change um, dictate how much effect and impact there is on our marine fisheries. And it, as, as Roger indicated, we are in a hot spot. We're seeing significant temperature changes. Um, now, summer flounder, have, have shifted and shifted significantly. Uh, Atlantic mackerel have, have essentially uh, left U.S. waters um, relative to, to where they were in the 1970s. In the 1970s, we had a foreign fleet fishery um, that was eventually moved out by the Magnuson Act in 1976. Then there was some joint venture fishing that occurred after that. But that fleet caught uh, literally hundreds of millions of pounds of mackerel. And, and then we had, we had a domestication of that fishery. We Americanized it. And in the 2000s, that fishery got up maybe to 100 million pounds. Um, but since then, uh, you know, the fishery has been at a low level of abundance. Um, we're still seeing juvenile fish in the surveys, but the commercial fishery in 2011 only caught 3% of its quota. 
So, you know, there was really a wholesale exodus of those fish from U.S. waters. They weren't available in commercial quantities. Um, and so the, the fishery really underperformed. Um, the, the third fish, black sea bass, uh, is one that, that has two populations. There's one south of Cape Hatteras, there's one north of Cape Hatteras. The fishery north of Cape Hatteras has significantly changed. Um, it used to be spread out uh, from the Virginia, North Carolina line um, up to below southern New England. And, and now southern New England is seeing a major pulse of fish uh, that extend all the way into the Gulf of Maine. And, and the performance of that part of the stock is, is excellent right now. Um, it's, it's changed at a pace that we can't even keep up with from an assessment standpoint on the stock side. So it poses significant management challenges. Th this shows the shifting distributions of summer flounder. Um, you can see back in the late 1960s and early 70s, the, the resource was concentrated um, at or below the, well, from the Virginia Capes and Oregon Inlet is down there uh, near the bottom. From there up through the Delmarva Peninsula, that, that was really the center of the population. But the population was subsequently rebuilt, and that has implications for this distribution too. That's why I'll point out there's some complexities that need to be understood. But as that population was rebuilt um, in recent years, it's redistributed. And so now it extends all the way up uh, to southern New England and out onto Georgia's banks. And, and that, that fishery uh, in a rebuilt condition has significantly changed. Now, part of that we think is related to temperature change, but part of that's also related to the expansion of the age structure of the population and the restoration of that. So fish have very strong thermal preferences. And uh, if you look at this chart, this was taken 11 days ago. This is a sea surface temperature uh, satellite shot from Rutgers. And if you look right down at that boundary right there, where that green, green water abuts the the red water right in 100 fathoms. That water is about 57 degrees, which happens to coincide with a preferred temperature for bluefish. So 11 days ago, there were, there were large bluefish schooled up on that break. They weren't five miles west of that. They weren't five miles east of that. They were right on that break. And there were three to 500 pound bluefin tunas eating the bluefish, and it was quite a spectacle. But that, that's how strong the thermal preference is. If you, if you move a mile away from that break, you won't see either of those species. If you move five miles away from that break, you may see an entirely different assemblage of species. So the thermal preferences that each of these fish have is something that's very important to understand. And that's why those, those movements track so well when you look at the, the results of the Penske paper. You, know, you see these climate velocities changing. You see these very clear movements in the distribution of fish. And it all comes together because of those thermal envelopes that each species has. So, so what about these benthic resources? Fish can move, but if you have a population of surf clams or ocean cohogs, um, maybe not. But in fact, what, what we've seen back in the 1970s, the, the, these resources were concentrated off Delmarva and off New Jersey. The fishery over time became highly concentrated. Most of the catch was coming out of one 10-minute square off New Jersey, um, which implies, I think, a level of susceptibility. Um, but now most of this resource, the 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 largest component of the resource now is distributed out on Georgia's banks. So there's been a significant change in the performance of this fishery. Um, the southern part, the southern range of the fishery off Delmarva has declined in terms of abundance in the absence of fishing pressure. There hadn't been any fishing pressure off there. It's all been from New Jersey north, um, and we, we think that's related to temperature. Um, these resources, because they're shellfish, though, also have another layer of vul vulnerability that we don't think we understand as well yet in terms of acidification, and you've already heard some about that. So this builds on what Roger did in terms of um, tracking some of the movements to the center of these populations. Uh, these are uh, five species that range in the northeast, including American lobster. That dramatic change in that curve, I think, reflects the fact that the southern New England lobster population uh, is largely collapsed, and now the Gulf of Maine uh, is doing very well. So um, you know, there's some specific attributes there, but some of these movements are very significant. I mean, if you consider a population shifting or the center of a population shifting from, say, the Virginia, North Carolina line all the way up to New Jersey, um, that has dramatic implications in terms of how the fishing communities and managers are going to interact with that resource. So, so what are the implications for the, for the human dimensions and for the fishing communities? Um, I would submit that they're, they're quite considerable. You know, in the Mid-Atlantic and in the Northeast, we have some very diverse fisheries. We have 
recreational fisheries that are extensive. We have millions of recreational anglers that take tens of millions of recreational fishing trips. Um, even within, within the recreational community, there's great diversity. There's also similarly a lot of diversity in the commercial fleet. And in terms of, in terms of the capacity of these different communities to adapt to climate change, um, I would submit that they have mixed capacities. You know, the, the concept of adaptation is one that's, um, that's really timeless in fisheries. I mean, fishermen have always been very effective at adapting, but we do have some gears in our fisheries that are static. So we have pound nutters that fish in fixed sites. Um, their ability to respond to a change in distribution of fish may be, in fact, very limited. And some, some fishing communities as a whole are relatively static, whereas in the upper right-hand corner, that, that's the Jason and Danielle out of Montauk, New York. Montauk is probably, as a fleet, the most mobile fleet on the coast. They fish up and, up and down the coast, and that, that boat fishes from Cape Hatteras to the Canadian line. So a boat like that, in terms of mobility, probably has a lot of adaptive capacity. Um, now on this slide, I have the Alaska as being highly adaptive. They're highly adaptive in terms of their range and mobility, but this introduces another uh, potential, uh, potential risk for the fisheries in that from a management standpoint, we, we've gone through this whole process where we had open access to fisheries. Um, that resulted in significant excess capacity and oversubscription in the fisheries. That had to be corrected through limited entry. Limited entry resulted in specialization within the fleet. So you have some fleets that are highly specialized and they may be very successful in that fishery as long as that, as long as that resource is healthy. But it does create another layer of risk because if, if there were a, an acidification problem in one of those fisheries that those specialized fleets were dependent upon, they, they may not have another alternative because of that degree of specialization. So, you know, what do we do about this? I mean, um, the ocean is always a dynamic place. And I, I've been in the fishery since I was a kid, and I, I don't think I've ever had two years or experienced two years that were quite the same. Um, so that, that type of variability is, is normal. It's something we expect in fisheries. Uh, but, you know, I think what we're seeing now is going well beyond that. I mean, there's variability, there, there are multi-decadal cycles, as Roger pointed out, in terms of the oscillations and those ocean, oceanographic influences. Um, but then there's long-term change, and, and that's, what, that's what we're seeing now. This is, on the right, this is a uh, projection of 27 different climate models that are synthesized, and it shows a projected 1.4 degrees Celsius increase in our region uh, between now and 2055. So, that, that may not be a big deal to us in this room if you think about air temperature, but in the ocean, given those thermal preferences, it can have major, major effects. And this is a directional change, so it's something I think we need to anticipate. So our approach to this is one that we're undertaking through the strategic planning framework that I referenced. Um, the first is to really come to terms with the, the change, and we, we, we've done that through a climate change workshop that really laid the scientific basis for this as a group. We just completed that earlier this year. We made that a priority for 2014. Um, meanwhile, we need, a, we need a risk analysis of all the species we manage to understand what their susceptibility is to climate change and also to potentially to acidification. The Northeast Fishery Science Center is completing that now. We expect those results this summer. That'll give us an informed picture of what we might anticipate. Um, when, you, when you consider the, the changes in their, in their impacts, we have to think about our gover governance and management models. On the East Coast, it's very complex because we have five species we manage jointly between our council and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. We have a lot of state-by-state -state quota allocations. Um, th these things may not respond well to changing distributions in the resource or be prepared to handle that. Um, so we want to understand that and, and from a planning standpoint anticipate how we might make those, those processes more adaptive in those structures. Um, and then have a strategy for adaptation and also for monitoring. So, again, in terms of where we are right now on the governance side, we, we have a number of impediments, I think, to adaptation. Uh, the state-by-state -state quotas that have allowed us, at least at the state level, to meet the needs of our fisheries as we see them through that state lens um, may, in fact, be challenged as these species shift. Um, so we need to think about, you know, how can we, um, you know, deal simultaneously with those political realities but also come to terms with these changing biological conditions. On the monitoring side, you know, we're in a difficult position because of budget considerations and 
um, limited resources. And I think to be successful at monitoring these changes, we're really going to have to be very comprehensive and think collaboratively about how to have an effective monitoring strategy mm -hmm. in the marine environment to monitor change, um, both in terms of temperature, pH, and also um, changing movements in the fish. So there are a lot of ways we can do that. I think we can put more terms of reference in our stock assessments and in our interactions with our industry advisors, but also to use the collaborative research efforts that we have ongoing. Um, the vessel at the bottom right is the Bigelow. That's the one that does the spring and fall trawl survey for NOAA. Um, they have tremendous uh, data collection capabilities. They collect hundreds of different data points uh, while they're doing their surveys. And then the, the Durana R to the bottom left um, is a survey vessel that does the NEMAP Cooperative Research Survey, which is a near coastal survey. Um, and then finally, that's a Maracuse glider. Um, and so I, you know, I think there's a way that we can, if, if, we, if we plan for it, we ought to be able to bring together a lot of these things in a coordinated approach for monitoring. I, you know, I have to end with this, but I, I grew up on the James River, um, and, and, and I, would, I would love to have seen uh, the ecosystem in the marine environment that Captain John Smith described. Um, and I, you know, I won't have that benefit, but that was 400 years ago. Um, and I think the, the ecosystem we're managing now is, is largely uh, modified. I mean, it's an artifact of a lot of anthropogenic effects. And uh, we have to come to term, terms with those changes, but the, uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory recorded CO2 levels of 400 parts per million uh, la last year. And I think that implies a certain level of change and a directionality in the change um, that we have to come to terms with from a planning standpoint. And I think if we do that in a, in a strategic way and in a way that's well informed by the available science, I think we'll position ourselves well for the future in fisheries. Thank you.